This episode contains distressing themes and descriptions of sexual violence. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener caution is advised. They Walk Among Us is part of the Acast Creator Network. Black was his uniform. He was the man in black, with black clothes, black thoughts, and the blackest deeds. Alex Carlisle QC, Mold Crown Court, November 1996. The court heard the attacks were frenzied, sadistic, and vicious. An outwardly successful businessman who could kill coldly and for fun. He killed using a combat knife and wore black Nazi-style uniforms which helped him dominate and terrify his victims. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 1 of They Walk Among Us, a podcast dedicated to UK true crime. This is Part 1 of a two-part case. The second instalment will be available in four days. It was still dark outside when police officers pulled into the car park at Penzarn Beach in North Wales on December 18, 1995. Sunrise was still two hours away, but the headlights of the police car shone down onto the pebbles of the beach. The officers had been informed that a 40-year-old father of two named Tony Davis had not returned home. Tony had left the previous evening at around 11pm to visit his aunt Anne in Abigella after she had fallen and broken her foot and elbow earlier that day. Tony had spent the day with his family and brought his aunt to visit her husband's grave, but she tumbled over as they left the cemetery. Tony wanted to check on her that night, so he travelled to Abigella. When he did not arrive home to his wife and children by 5.30am, Tony's wife Sheila rang Anne and asked if Tony was still there. After Anne told Sheila that he had left shortly after midnight, concerned for his welfare, Sheila called the police. An hour later, Tony's blue Ford Escort was spotted parked in front of Penzarn Beach. As officers approached to see if he had just fallen asleep inside the vehicle, they were distracted by something at the shoreline. They walked onto Penzarn Beach from the promenade as the smooth pebbles clattered under their feet. At 6.30am, most of the sand on the beach was covered by high tide, and as the officers got closer to the shore that morning, they realised someone was lying at the water's edge. PC Phil Greaves found an individual lying face up, wearing jeans and a white Aaron jumper. Michael Davis was at the scene and was able to immediately identify the man as his brother. There were no signs of life, and the body was cold to the touch. Fearing the tide would lift the body, PC Greaves pulled Tony by the ankles away from the water's edge. As he was being moved, his jumper was pulled up, revealing numerous bloody wounds to his abdomen. Scenes of crime officers arrived and began collecting evidence from the area where Tony Davis's body was discovered. There were clear signs of a struggle. Footwear impressions had been preserved by the damp sand at the water's edge, and the tide had not yet washed away blood droplets on the pebbles further back from the shoreline. As dawn approached, 
Penzan Beach was cordoned off as groups of officers combed the area for anything that could help the investigation. Detective Superintendent Peter Ackerley told reporters, We are treating the incident as suspicious. We will now have to wait for reports from the pathologist and forensic experts before we can conclude he was killed where the body was found. Home Office pathologist Dr David Waite had arrived at the beach and completed a provisional examination of Tony Davis's body. The remains had been concealed from curious eyes and protected from the elements by a white and yellow tent. During his initial observation, Dr Waite noted that the victim was clothed, but the zip on his jeans was undone. A post-mortem examination concluded that the victim had been stabbed six times with a double-edged seven-inch blade. He had been stabbed once in the back and five times in the chest in what seemed to be a frenzied attack. As the investigators began to canvass the immediate area, those who knew Tony Davis were shocked by his murder. Tony was born and raised in Llithvain. His family was scattered in neighbouring towns and villages close by. He lived with his wife Sheila and his two children, Rebecca and Sean, on Bocha Gwint Road. He had been working as a crematorium assistant for three years at the time of his death. It was a relatively new career for Tony, who had spent most of his working life in a bakery after discovering a love of the culinary arts at the Village Youth Club in 1973. While North Wales typically had a low crime rate, Tony Davis was the third man to be killed during the last three months of 1995 and he was far from the first man to be attacked on Penzan Beach. Penzan Beach was a popular destination for tourists during the bright summer months. Still unbeknownst to most locals, the secluded shoreline served as a meeting point for some gay men, either hiding their sexuality or simply looking for an anonymous sexual encounter. However, the stigma surrounding same-sex relationships in the mid-90s in rural Wales meant that men were putting themselves in danger when making a connection with strangers in the dark on Penzan Beach. Many gay men had been attacked in the preceding decade, and it was suspected that many more had not felt confident enough to report the violence against them. With no witnesses to Tony Davis's murder and no known reason for stopping at the beach after visiting his aunt, the police suspected he was living a double life. As a result, the investigators appealed to members of the gay community to contact them if they had any information about the case, or if they had been a victim of an assault on the beach in the past. Detective Superintendent Ackerley said, The picture that is emerging is that Mr Davis was involved in homosexual activities on Penzan Beach. Two callers have told us they have been assaulted on Penzan Beach and in toilets in Kinmal Bay. They have not come forward until now because they have not wanted their families to know of their activities. If anyone else has been subjected to assaults in that area, we would ask that they contact us. I want to appeal to anyone in Penzan who thinks they saw anything to contact us. The detective explained that he knew that men travelled from Merseyside and Manchester to meet at the beach, and it had been advertised as a meeting place in gay magazines nationwide. Detective Superintendent Ackerley appealed to anyone with information to come forward and assured witnesses their statements would be treated with the strictest confidence. 
Speaking about Tony Davis's murder, the detective added, We are no clearer to discovering a motive, but the term queer bashing has come up. We cannot rule that in or out. Neither can we rule in or out a sexual motive. The increase in homophobic violence was alarming. In the days after Tony Davis's murder, the independent newspaper reported that a recent survey had found that more than one-third of gay men and women had been victims of abuse. Homophobic attacks were not distinguished as hate crimes at the time, but the police promised to launch a new scheme that would record attacks on gay victims in a similar way to racially motivated crimes. Inspector Stuart Brook with the West Yorkshire Police said, We want to have anti-gay incidents monitored in a similar way to racial ones. At the moment, we do not know the full scale of the problem. We hope the scheme will give the gay community the confidence to come to the police and will show that we are taking the matter seriously. Similar schemes were already operating in larger areas such as London and Manchester. The authorities had found that the distinction in the way that crimes were recorded had helped inform inquiries, including the investigation into Colin Island, a man who had been convicted of killing five gay men in 1993. It was hoped that the new schemes would give the gay community more confidence and trust in the police and encourage them to report homophobic attacks instead of suffering in silence as they had for so long. Locals were shocked to learn about the nighttime activities on Penzan Beach, but not because of the homophobic attacks perpetrated against men there. One man told the North Wales newspaper, I have lived in the town for over 20 years, yet I had no idea the beach was known as a haunt for homosexuals. It horrifies me. This is portraying the area in a dreadful light. When we're trying to attract tourists, people are going to think it's not a place to bring the family. Tony Davis's loved ones adamantly denied that he had gone to the beach to meet men. At a press conference in Colwyn Bay, his devastated widow Sheila said, He was such a lovely man. He loved me and the children so much, and we miss him so much. He wouldn't have hurt anyone. He was so loving. Tony's brother Michael also addressed the press and appealed to the public. He said, There's not a lot we can do to help apart from ask anyone who knows anything to call the police. We are still in a state of shock and can't understand why this has happened to him. No one could ask for a better brother. Everyone got on so well with him and he had no enemies at all. We just miss him so much. Tony Davis's death was the third murder in three months, and the community in Abigella and those people in surrounding areas in North Wales were terrified that men were being attacked and killed. In September 1995, 53-year-old Henry Roberts was a single man living in Kegeliog in Anglesey. He was born and raised in the area, attending Isgul Kegeliog before going on to a school in Triada Bay. Henry was an only child and lived with his mother until her death in 1986. At the time he was working for British Rail in Holyhead, but he was made redundant in 1991. Henry had always been eccentric and reclusive, and after receiving redundancy money and stock shares and a farmhouse from his mother, he never seemed short of cash. 
while he spent most of his time alone in his house with just the company of his dog, Henry frequently visited the Sportsman Inn and was known to spend up to £200 a week at the bar. He also had his dinner at a restaurant in Hollyhead most evenings. By September 27, 1995, Henry had not been seen at the Sportsman Inn for a few days. Another regular, Thomas Wright, became concerned for Henry's welfare and decided to go to Henry's farmhouse to ensure that everything was okay. Thomas entered through the front door of the property and called out Henry's name. The house was filthy and a pungent odour hung in the air. Dog feces covered areas of the floor. Thomas paused, thinking he would hear Henry call back, but there was no response. He then walked out into the yard and saw Henry lying face down in front of an outhouse. Henry's trousers were around his ankles, and Thomas could clearly see bloody wounds on Henry's buttocks. The sight of a dead body stunned him and caused Thomas to burst into tears before he quickly fled to the Sportsman Inn to report what he had seen. After officers arrived at the property, Home Office pathologist Dr David Waite determined that Henry Roberts had been stabbed a total of 27 times with a double-edged knife. He had been dead for two to three days by the time his body was discovered. As well as predator marks on Henry's remains, there were 13 stab wounds to his back and 14 to his front. His cause of death was massive hemorrhage due to his injuries. Rumours swirled about the possible motive behind the attack. Henry had never been seen with a woman. Many presumed he was gay. Despite his apparent financial stability, he lived in squalid conditions and always appeared scruffy. However, there could well have been a financial motive for Henry Roberts' murder according to Detective Superintendent Gareth Jones, who said... We have established that he was in the habit of carrying a very substantial amount of money with him when he went into the local public house, and we have recovered a large sum of cash from various places in the house. A great number of people would know about his habit of carrying cash. Although robbery could be a motive, there is no sign of violence or search in the building itself. He lived his own life and while he was friendly to everyone in the village, he does not seem to have had many individual friends. He was a shy individual, and was not the sort of person who would be the first to make conversation. He was very much a loner. Henry also had an apparent interest in Nazism, as Nazi paraphernalia was found throughout his home. He did not drive, and often used taxis to get to the restaurants and pubs in Kegeliog and Hollyhead. This led the police to question a number of taxi drivers and motorists who used the A5 that ran alongside Henry's home at the time of his death. A Hollyhead taxi driver, 29-year-old Nigel Owens, had been arrested and charged with Henry Roberts' murder on December 10th. But after Tony Davis was killed with a similar weapon, investigators could not rule out a link between the murders. This raised several questions about Owen's involvement, as it was clear he did not kill Tony Davis, as he was in custody at the time. Almost two months after Henry Roberts was found dead, 
Another murder shocked locals in Anglesey. 49-year-old Keith Randalls was a hard-working father and grandfather who had been divorced for five years in November 1995. Keith was employed as a roadwork security operator for a firm in Ellesmere Port, owned by his longtime friend Robert Scott. Originally from Chester, Keith had moved to a site near Mona in Anglesey in September 1995 and lived in a caravan by the roadworks. Keith was widely regarded as being a likeable family man who was witty, but he was also shy and reserved, often keeping to himself while living in Anglesey. However, he took every chance he could get to visit his children and grandchildren and love to spoil them. On the night of November 29th, Keith called his daughter Lisa, as he did most evenings. He had spent the weekend prior celebrating his daughter Justine's birthday, and when his contract ended, he looked forward to spending Christmas with Lisa, her husband, and their children. Keith was in good spirits as he spoke on the phone that night and told his daughter he planned on getting some fish and chips for dinner and then crashing out in front of the television. Lisa later recalled that her father seemed the happiest he had been for some time, and she could not wait to finalise plans for his surprise 50th birthday the following month. Before the call ended, Keith told Lisa, Send my love to the kids and give them a kiss from me. Look after yourself. See you soon. Construction staff arrived on site at 7.30 the following morning and found something terrible. Keith Randalls was lying face up in a pool of blood on the gravel outside his caravan. He was wearing just a shirt and underwear and blood was smeared on the caravan door. Investigators quickly determined that he was likely interrupted as he got ready for bed. Keith had been stabbed 12 times with a double-edged knife, and there were superficial wounds to the upper part of his body and face, indicating he had fought hard for his life. Keith Randall's cause of death was listed as massive blood loss due to multiple stab wounds to his heart and lungs. It was noted that several items were missing from his caravan, including his mobile phone, a video recorder, and a wooden-style radio. Investigators told reporters they were anxious to trace a white transit van spotted in the area. Describing how her father was a kind, loving, and affectionate man, Keith Randall's daughter Lisa said... He did not have any enemies and was very close to his family. He would go out of his way to help us. He would travel back from Anglesey to see us and did this recently when one of the children was ill. We're all finding it very difficult, but we are pulling together as a family and supporting each other. We are still very much in shock. As far as we are concerned, there are no reasons for what has happened. And obviously, the person who did this is very dangerous. Whoever has done this needs help and needs to be caught. After the police suspected Tony Davis's murder was potentially a homophobic attack, a hotline was established to allow anonymous callers who may have been assaulted at Penzarn Beach or had any information about the case to speak with the police. Within 24 hours, over 50 calls had been logged, but one caller stood out. The man said he had been on Penzarn Beach six months earlier 
when he met a tall man in leather clothing who invited him back to a property in the Abagella area. He recalled being driven to Kinmal Bay, where he was taken to a house on the right-hand side of the road and subjected to a physical attack that lasted several hours. The caller declined to give his name and address, but one of the lead investigators on the case, Detective Constable David Morris, knew the area well as he had worked as a uniformed constable in Tawin for years. After following the directions the caller provided, Detective Constable Morris recognised the building on St. Asif Avenue. It belonged to a local business owner, a man who was occasionally known to wear black leather clothing. He had a reputation as a generous person who was always willing to help others, especially customers of the shop his family ran. Another promising tip had come in from someone who had seen a white transit van with a diamond decal on its side, parked at the beach on the night Tony Davis was killed. Investigators discovered that the motif on the side was the logo for Birch Van Hire, and they scanned through a list of people who had rented a van in the area. All of the pieces of the puzzle finally started to fall into place when the name of a man on the list seemed familiar. He lived at the house where an anonymous caller claimed to have been tortured. Peter Moore was the only child of Edith and Ernest Moore. The couple were well into their forties by the time their son was born, and while conceiving a child felt like a miracle to Edith, Ernest was far less emotional. When Peter Moore was six years old, the family moved from St Helens Merseyside to Kimnall Bay in North Wales. They lived in the biggest property in the area, Darlington House. The Moore family ran an ironmonger's from the ground floor of the building, and young Peter Moore helped out after completing his education at Abigella Secondary School. Moore was exceptionally close to his mother, and often accompanied her on holidays and day trips to the cinema with the Kinmal Bay Women's Institute. It was there that Moore discovered his first love. Film. Moore's mother thought the world of her son. She felt he was truly a blessing. Neighbour Bet McWilliams later said, She never expected to have him. He was her pride and joy. It's been reported that Ernest Moore was a violent alcoholic who had very little time for his son, unless it was to berate or beat him. Moore also claimed he had a hard time in school and was singled out because of his height and what was perceived as a feminine demeanour. George and Joan Marland lived in a bungalow behind Darlington House and had known Peter Moore since he was young. Recalling how the man they knew as charming, thoughtful and generous would bring their children presents at Easter and Christmas, they said... He was like a big brother to them. He used to make his own fairground machines in the garden and would pay children out through the window when they won. Edith Moore ran the village library while her husband and son worked out of Darlington House selling tools and bottled gas. However, after Ernest's death in 1979, Moore took on his father's role but was never allowed to run the shop alone unless he consulted with his chummy, the affectionate nickname he had for his mother. The hardware store evolved into selling all types of goods and capitalised on the increasing tourist trade in the area by selling bottles of gas to holidaymakers in caravans. 
Peter Moore was an imposing figure with short grey hair and a thick moustache, but he was regarded by those that knew him as being softly spoken and gentle. In 1990, Moore was able to accomplish a lifelong goal of owning a cinema. Speaking with The Visitor in July 1995, he described how he had dreamed of owning a cinema from a young age. Moore said, It all began when I was about six. I went out to the Odeon at Rill to see Lady and the Tramp, and I was spellbound. I said to myself, I'm going to have a cinema. Moore had put his dream on hold for decades while he helped to run his parents' ironmongers, but he met a cinema manager who inspired him to pursue his goals. He opened his first cinema in Bagilth that same year. He told the visitor, We were very lucky. We purchased the seats from the Gaiety Theatre Reel when they were knocking it down. The projector came from the Concord at Bristol and the ticket machine from the Princess Cinema at Colwyn Bay. The start was shaky, to put it politely, but now we've achieved quite a professional standard. We do get people coming to us from places like Prestatin and Denby. Within the next few years... Peter Moore had opened two more cinemas in Hollyhead and Denby. He explained the success was down to offering cheap admission and bringing families back into the cinema, with family tickets costing just £5. Moore said most of the profits came from selling refreshments rather than tickets, and he ran films for longer than other cinemas. He said... Dumb and Dumber has been going in my two cinemas for ten weeks now. I tend to like the popular comedies. I get quite a kick out of hearing laughter in the cinema. Moore described how he was wary of staying in the building after closing time, though, as he believed a ghost named Susie who had white hair and wore preacher robes haunted the screens. He claimed she had appeared in the middle of the October 1993 showing of Hocus Pocus. Moore told the reporter that the only thing that prevented a busy day at the cinema was good. No one watches films when it's sunny, he said. We pray for light rain. Not enough to keep them in their homes, but just enough to get them into the foyer. Recalling how Moore was very dexterous and could manage multiple tasks at once, an employee who used to type out the cinema listing stated, He enjoyed doing the cinemas up and did all his own renovation work. He liked to work in the projection room and learnt about it so he could do it himself. He would have a laugh when it broke down because it was like the old-time cinema then. Peter Moore was even featured on news reports with his fledgling business and relished in the attention he was getting for breathing life back into the medium of cinema in North Wales. No one was more proud of his success than his mother Edith. By this time she was in her eighties and spent the last few years of her life enjoying holidays abroad with her son, until her death in 1994. Moore was devastated, and his neighbours recalled that he threw himself into his work as a way to cope with her passing. While Peter Moore was not openly gay, many suspected that he was, and once information emerged linking him to the murder of Tony Davis the police began to suspect that he was a predatory killer. Officers descended on Kinmal Bay on December 21st, 1995, with a warrant to arrest 49-year-old Peter Moore in relation to the murder of Tony Davis on Penzan Beach three days prior. He was taken to Llandidno Police Station and held for questioning, 
as investigators began to search Darlington House. The interviewing officers were Detective Constable Morris and Detective Sergeant Guthrie. Moore denied going to Penzan Beach on the night in question or parking his rental van in the area. Noting a cut on Moore's right hand, the investigators obtained a warrant to compare Moore's blood to blood found at the murder scene. While the first few hours of the interview process turned up very little, discoveries at Moore's home propelled the investigation forward rapidly. Darlington House is a large two-storey building, closer in appearance to a retail unit than it is to a family home. At the front of the property was the old hardware store, and at the rear was Moore's home where he had lived for 43 years. Floral pattern carpets and curtains showed that Moore had changed very little in the property after his mother's death a year earlier. But when officers entered his bedroom, they were shocked by the difference in decor. On a shelf in the room, there were a number of hats, including a police helmet, a Nazi helmet, and a flat leather cap. More clothes were hanging in the closet, leather trousers, a black studded belt, high black boots, an army jacket, and a police coat. A bloody swastika flag hung on the wall. Hanging on a hook next to Moore's bed, they found a large wooden truncheon, handcuffs, sex toys, a rubber gag, and a silver dog collar. In the corner of the room, there was a blood-stained leather jacket, and more blood was spattered up the walls and onto the ceiling in a cast-off pattern. Officers also discovered newspaper reports on Tony Davis's murder in the house. Beneath the stairs, they found Tony's navy woolen coat, which had been missing since he was killed. The back garden was searched, and in a pond, investigators found a mobile phone, a set of keys for a Ford Escort, a black key wallet and a plastic bag containing women's underwear, miniskirts, stockings and shoes. In bushes around the property, officers also recovered a wallet belonging to Henry Roberts. Moore's rental van was also examined. Inside, officers recovered a blood-stained white cloth, a gold watch resembling a watch missing from Keith Randall's caravan and a large black-handled hunting knife in a brown sheath. Even after being confronted with some of the evidence found during the searches, Peter Moore continued to deny he was involved in any criminal activity. He was charged with the murder of Tony Davis and remanded into custody. Investigators were confident he was responsible for other violent crimes committed in the area prior to his arrest. Moore was sent back to the cells in Llandidno Police Station for the night and spent time writing at the desk beside his bed before falling asleep around midnight. An hour later, he pressed the alarm bell, which brought the custody sergeant Geraint Williams to his cell. Moore told the officer that he wanted to make an admission. After Williams told Moore that he was not part of the investigation and could not take a statement from him, Moore went on to say, I want to tell you that I have been responsible for a lot of things since the 1970s, like attacks on men, mostly sexual. Peter Moore said that he wanted to speak to someone so he could make a full confession to four murders, including one the police had yet to discover. Peter Moore was known as a successful cinema owner, but behind that a court was told was a man who felt no remorse at killing. 
Flanked by prison officers, Moore was taken before a judge and jury today, charged with murdering four men last winter. This is the end of episode one. The second instalment in this two-part case will be available in four days. Thank you for listening. A special thanks to our new Patreon producer, Lisa, and all our patrons for supporting the podcast. To hear ad-free versions of our episodes published several days before their general release, subscribe to They Walk Among Us Plus. Head to patreon.com forward slash They Walk Among Us or search for They Walk Among Us on Apple Podcasts to learn more. For more information on this episode, please see the show notes or visit our website, theywalkamonguspodcast.com. <laughs>